like to welcome everyone this morning to our session, Coffee and Conversations with Legislators. And this is a series that we've started this year. Um, we're working with former Senator Bobby Zirkin uh, to really bring the voices of Annapolis here to our MSBA members. And today we are continuing to engage in this connection. And we're welcoming Jeff Waldstriker from Montgomery County, where he serves as vice chairman of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, um, previously at the House of Delegates. So he has well over a decade of experience in Annapolis uh, to share with us today. And we would welcome you to ask any questions throughout the session. We have the chat function that you can use. And we'll just ask that you stay on mute otherwise during the program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bobby. All right, well, good morning, everyone. And good morning, Senator Waldstriker. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Of course, um, it's great to see you. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. And let me just, uh, we're gonna, uh, we have a lot to cover in, in a very short amount of time. I'm very honored to be able to interview uh, my former colleague and uh, former member colleague when I was uh, chairing the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, Jeff Waldstriker, who Shally just said has uh, just years and years of experience in both the House of Delegates on the House Judiciary Committee and now as Vice Chairman of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee. We're going to start, uh, rather than run through his resume, I'm going to start with the question, Jeff, if it's okay with you, to talk about where you represent your district and how you got into politics, uh, just so people can get a little introduction into who you are. Uh, well, thank you, Bobby, for hosting this. Thank you, Shally, for putting this together. And thank you to the Bar Association for having me this morning, um, I hope everyone had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend um, and a meaningful Memorial Day itself. So um, I represent Lower Montgomery County in the Maryland General Assembly. Um, I've been in the Senate for the last few years and before that, the House of Delegates. And so we live in Chevy Chase, Silver Spring, Kensington, Wheaton, Garrett Park, a little bit of Rockville. You're likely in my legislative district. Um, I'm honored to represent one of the more diverse legislative districts. Um, throughout Maryland and folks of every color and stripe and background. And that's really what makes my job meaningful, um, just to, to, to meet so many folks from um, all different backgrounds. And it's really a pleasure. Um, my background is, is interesting. I, you know, the Bar Association, I imagine, um, represents a lot of folks who are, um, you know, chief counsel too, uh, or chief of staff too. And, and in my um, in my training, I always thought that's where I would end up um, as chief counsel to the House Judiciary Committee on the Hill or, or chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. I always viewed myself as behind the scenes and I was excited for a career in that sense. Um, I ended up in elected politics by accident. I was working at a big firm, thinking of switching it over to government at some point uh, when I brought in a pro bono client that I really enjoyed with. There was a midterm retirement in the Maryland General Assembly and my pro bono client came to me and said, hey, um, don't you live in that district? And I said, well, I don't know what a legislative district is. They said, no, 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 you live there. Uh, we're gonna put your name forward. It's a weird process where you put your name forward to like the local Democratic Party activists. And, um, and, and they kind of did all the work. Now it turns out I didn't win that appointment, but I got a taste for how politics works and really enjoyed it. And so when there was an actual electoral vacancy a couple of years later, uh, I ran for that and, and was very privileged to win for the House of Delegates. Great, and what year was that that you were first um, appointed and elected into office? It's a long time ago, Bobby, you're making me show my age. So um, I was elected in 2006, taking office, swearing in in 2007, the next year. All right. And you served in the House Judiciary Committee under Chairman Valerio. And I did. I did. Yeah. So Joe Valerio, who, by the way, I would sit next to sometimes when he was making fundraising calls and he would go through the Bar Association directory. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that out loud, <laughs> but but we would sit next to him. goes on this on, on coffee. And <laughs> um, but we miss Joe. We're glad glad to know that he's well. Uh, Joe, Joe was a wonderful mentor to me. Um, as many of you might imagine, my politics coming from a very progressive district were very different from Chairman Valerio's, um, but we got along as people. So eight years on that committee, four years on the Economic Matters Committee. Um, my illustrious Senator, Rich Maddalino, 
um, then ran for governor and I ran for his Senate seat. And so that's how I ended up in the Senate and a wonderful return after four years away to, to the Judiciary Committee, the Judicial Proceedings Committee on the Senate side. All right. Well, let's hop into some, uh, some, some law and some, some legislation. You just came off of a very, very uh, challenging legislative session for 2021. I think somebody's uh, button is on. Um, so 2021, uh, the, the 2020 legislative session was, was stopped uh, because of COVID. And so a lot of bills did not end up making it over the finish line. 2021 was, was challenging, obviously, to, due to the pandemic and a lot of hot button issues. So let's just start with an open-ended question. Talk about the 2021 session, some of the things you were, that you were excited about having happened, maybe some disappointments, and then we're going to get into some specific, uh, some specific laws and bills. Yeah, that's great. It's so interesting coming off of Memorial Day weekend because I saw folks out and about, and when they were outdoors, they were mostly maskless. And it's such a contrast to where we were just a few months ago in the winter at the peak of this thing. And it's, it's easy to forget how tough that was. And um, that was smack dab in the middle of the legislative session. And so it was a, an extremely tough session because the Senate was operating in person at the beginning, we were unvaccinated and we were essentially living in these phone booths, um, these plexiglass contraptions on the floor of the Senate. And I couldn't even speak to the person sitting next to me. And that made the legislative session very difficult because at the core of what we do is communicating with each other, compromising, getting you know at a table, figuring things out. And it was really difficult to do that. Um, but despite those challenges, we, um, had an amazing session and did right by the people of Maryland. So here are the three big things that we did. Uh, most importantly, we did COVID relief. So for people who needed the relief most, low-income renters, owners of restaurants, um, businesses in the hospitality industry impacted by COVID, we got them the, the relief that they needed. And sometimes, as we've seen at the federal level, that just meant um, cash. That just meant checks directly to impacted people that would keep them afloat until the economy opened back up as it has started to do. The second thing we did was police reform. Uh, we couldn't get out of this legislative session without doing the right thing for the people of Maryland uh, to recognize the racial reckoning that we're in and make sure we bring police accountability and trust back to the state of Maryland. And I think we did a really good job uh, with that under the leadership of President Ferguson um, and Will Smith, my chairman of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. And the third thing we did is, you know, even as this pandemic took hold, we can't forget that the, we're in the midst of this kind of generational climate crisis. Now, Bobby, you have young kids, I have young kids. I know many people on this call have young kids um, and, um, and they will be directly impacted in their lifetimes by the climate crisis if we don't act. Um, and so we started to move dramatically in the direction of reducing carbon emissions in Maryland. We didn't get everything we want. That's natural in a legislative session, but we'll come back next year to finish the job. So COVID relief, police reform, um, environmental progress, those were the three biggies of this past legislative session. Okay. Um, I'm gonna get to a fourth one that at least struck me as something, and I think people that are um, you know, on all sides of uh, the bar would be interested in a bill that you championed this year that did not get any publicity whatsoever, but I think is one of the bigger uh, issues of the session. And that had to do with the courts themselves um, and the so-called a mountain controversy bill that you were the lead sponsor of. And if you could speak a little bit about what that issue was all about and how it all kind of uh, you know came to a conclusion towards the end of the session, you could speak to that then. Yeah, that's a great question. So as, as most of us call know, in Maryland, there's of course um, an amount in controversy distinction between what goes to the district court and what goes to the circuit. Now I practice primarily in federal court. So this is not an area that I'm particularly familiar with, but once I understood the issue, I became deeply passionate about it. Our district court is a very accessible court. Um, it's a court where discovery burdens are low, where the costs of litigating are is low and we want our district court to remain accessible to everyday Marylanders, it's critical. But because of inflation, medical inflation, a lot of cases that should have been handled in the district court were going to the circuit court 
where folks need attorneys, um, where experts need to be hired, where discovery is extensive. And that's just not good for everyday Marylanders. It means um, either they settle their cases uh, too early or they have to go to trial and bear this tremendous burden. And so what we did was seek to up the amount in controversy distinction between district court and circuit court from $15,000 to $30,000. Um, now throughout the, the sausage making of the legislative process, eventually that bill got bumped down slightly to $25,000. So if your case is $25,000 or more, now you'll go to the circuit court, but if it's below $25,000, you'll now have access to the district court uh, where costs are lower and accessibility is much higher. So it's a dramatic win for the people of Maryland. Um, I'm excited about it. I think in any other year, it would have gotten some attention and some press. Now, of course, none of us do this for the attention or the press, especially with newspapers being eviscerated. We don't get much of that anyway. So this got no coverage at all, but it's very important for the people of Maryland. I'm really proud that we did it. And so just to be clear for the people that are listening, this is not to take effect yet because this has to go to a constitutional, it's a constitutional amendment when you change this. And so this will take place, assuming that the voters um, approve it after the next uh, election, correct? That's exactly right. So after the 2022 ballot, where the, every constitutional amendment in the state of Maryland has to go on the ballot before it's approved. Um, and so after 2022, it'll take effect. That's a good clarification. Um, and just so folks know, I mean, what the reason we have to do this every so often is because this distinction between circuit and district courts is in the constitution of the state of Maryland. Our constitution is a strange document. <laughs> um, it's not quite as concise as the federal constitution, not quite as values laden as the federal constitution. Sometimes it gets into the nitty gritty um, and that's okay. But when we change it, it means it can't go into effect. Immediately it has to get approved by the voters of the state. All right. Um, you know, you brought up the constitution. I'm gonna jump around with some of the concepts that I had written down that I wanted to discuss. One of the things that at least has been bounced around as a possibility for the constitution, although it has not come to that at this point, is the issue of cannabis, interestingly. So the question, I'm gonna throw this one out to you because obviously in the state of Maryland, you have the criminal law, decriminalization, that's one track. You have the medical cannabis world, that's another track. And then there's this concept about recreational legalization. They're all three are different things. So this year, I don't think anything happened in, in a kind of in, in the big recreational. Can you speak to that concept where we are in the state, I've had a lot of questions that I, that from po folks who wanted to ask you about this. What are what is going on with Maryland and legalization of marijuana? Are we heading there? Where where do we stand at this point? So great question. So currently in Maryland, medical cannabis is allowed, and so if you have a recognized medical condition, um, you can see a physician who is registered with our Cannabis Commission, and you can receive what is essentially a prescription, although we don't call it a prescription, for medical cannabis. And this is really important for folks with very serious diseases, um, AIDS, Crohn's disease, wasting Wait. cancer, glaucoma. Um, these diseases are diseases for which cannabis can provide substantial relief. And um, I was proud to work with many folks, including yourself, to make sure that people who are hurting had access to this drug. Um, the next question is, do we take it farther? Um, do we do what many of our neighboring states have, have done, which is to legalize recreational cannabis? Uh, in my opinion, the answer is yes. Uh, we didn't do it this past legislative session, in part because we were so constrained by COVID. But if I had to guess, we're going to come back in the next legislative session and do it. And that means two things. First of all, it means a lot for, I see the state's attorney from my jurisdiction, John McCarthy, who's an incredible state's attorney, um, and Jessica Hall in his office. Um, so it'll impact um, their work when it comes to criminal law, when we uh, legalize recreational cannabis. Now, John and many of his fellow state's attorneys have been extremely progressive in using their judgment in not prosecuting low-level drug offenses. And, and we really appreciate that in Montgomery County. That's the right direction to go. Um, but of course, in, in legalizing that, that will become the rules statewide. And then for many members of the bar, um, some of whom are starting to specialize in cannabis law, uh, the legalization of recreational 
uh, cannabis will be a business opportunity because you're going to have a lot of businesses that are going to need legal assistance going through the licensing process to grow or sell recreational cannabis. Um, and so it'll be a, a, a huge business opportunity for many attorneys that want to look into that. So um, it's an interesting thing what, what you just brought up, and, and it's good to see uh, State's Attorney McCarthy here as well. I see him up on the screen as well. It is a strange position, though, for Maryland, wouldn't you say? As a lawyer, you have the federal government, which, had, which considers all of this completely illegal and, and doesn't count marijuana or cannabis any different than crack or cocaine, or actually not even cocaine, crack. And so the question is, you know, how does Maryland move or should Maryland move in your opinion and just simply ignore the federal government or should we just simply, or, or, or should we take into account, you know, kind of their thoughts or lack thereof on this issue? Yeah, so we're now about a decade into the federal government ignoring what states do when it comes to cannabis. And so the Obama administration was the administration that began the process of allowing states to move to legalize medical and then recreational marijuana. The Trump administration for all their flaws, dramatic flaws, um, didn't take up the mantle of reinforcing um, a lot of these laws. And now we, here we are with the Biden administration, which is back to the Obama administration policy. So, um, so now more than a decade's worth of policy allows us to move confidently, knowing that even though this is really weird, where it's criminalized at the federal level and we're doing the opposite at the state level, it should feel weird, and it is, but uh, you know, everyone's kind of used to it at this point. Other states, including red states, have moved in this direction, so I think we can feel comfortable doing it. And Bobby, let me just bring up something, because uh, above me I see uh, Christopher Dews from the Job Opportunities Task Force, who's been a wonderful advocate on behalf of expungement which is another important area when it comes to cannabis, because even folks like John, who no longer prosecute low-level drug offenses, that wasn't the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you have thousands upon thousands of people with marijuana convictions on their record. And that's, that's untenable if we seek to legalize it. People should not have criminal, criminal records for things that will become legal. And so I wanna thank Christopher and his staff at the Job Opportunities Task Force, who have been the leading voice in making sure we can shield or expunge folks' uh, records who have criminal convictions for marijuana. Absolutely. And actually, if, if you legalize automatically, uh, that becomes, because uh, just a few years ago, you uh, supported and helped push through a bill to say that any crime that is no longer a crime is automatically expungible. And so if you legalize marijuana, that automatically happens without any further action. So it's an interesting kind of tie-in with, with all the work that you've been doing. That's exactly right. And Bobby, you get a tremendous amount of credit for moving a lot of those bills through. Um, and just a quick shout out while we're here to Judge Morrissey from the district court who has worked with us because when you do expungement, it requires a lot of technology work on the back end to, you know, we talk in concept about you know, getting folks their record clean. Well, someone actually has to do the physical cleaning, the technology cleaning to get this literally off of people's records. Um, and Judge Morrissey, to his credit, has been a tremendous partner in working with his technology people so that when we say, get it off someone's record or automatically expunge it, that it actually happens. So I, I imagine he's not on this call, but I wanna thank him and the rest of the judiciary for making that workable. Great, really important issues. Um, let's move, uh, switch it up a little bit. I would, uh, we have, you know, not as much time as I'd love to, uh, to be able to get through lots of issues. But, you know, one of the things that you were very much behind the scenes, didn't, didn't come out in front of the cameras, but I know was, you were very deeply involved in was, was the issue of Grace's Law and cyberbullying and something that unfortunately during the pandemic has been exacerbated. And I know that's something that's a passion of yours. Could you speak, obviously that's a passion of mine as well. Could you speak to kind of your involvement in Grace's Law as well as where, if, if you think that that should be expanded and where you think it should be expanded? Well, so for our audience here, Bobby is being modest. Bobby, when he was in the Senate, was the chief sponsor and chief driver behind Grace's Law, which is an important anti-bullying law um, that takes into account that much of bullying now happens over social media. And so the tension 
when you talk about the issue of bullying is um, when it becomes criminal um, and when it becomes dangerous versus when it is just speech, uh, when, it, when it is kids being kids, when it is speech that should be protected. Um, I come to this with a background as a, a fierce civil libertarian, um, someone who considers himself um, a First Amendment absolutist who, who, who works closely with the ACLU on civil liberties issues. But it was a very easy call for me, um, both as a policymaker and as a father to young children, and as someone who has seen, as we all have, social media develop into a place that is not so pleasant all the time, uh, which is that bullying, whether it's in person or social media, if it causes real harm and is designed to intimidate or otherwise um, hurt someone, is not protected speech and cannot be protected speech um, and, and rightfully can be um, in our courts. And so Grace's Law is a tremendous step forward to, for us to say that we do not allow this in the state of Maryland and that bullying children online in a way that causes real actual harm is not protected speech and can be criminalized. And, and so Bobby, thank you for, for passing this law. Um, and I, I imagine it's helped um, hundreds if not thousands of children get out from underneath a terrible, terrible social bullying, uh, social media bullying. And then the question is, well, we've got this very successful law in Maryland we were among the first to pass it. Other states have followed our lead. Where do we go from here? And if we believe as I do, that if bullying and social media trolling can cause real world har harm, then why do we limit this to just children? Um, can we expand this to include speech aimed at harassing, intimidating, stalking adults via social media? And I think that might be the next step for Grace's Law. And I think it's a legitimate step um, and, and one that we could find support from you know, both sides of the aisle in the General Assembly. All right. And also, I know that the, something that you, I, I recall from the debate, uh, the education component about making sure that kids and parents understand their rights, that, um, that they don't just have to face this alone in the courts, but actually, I mean, face this alone just among themselves, that they can actually find some, some uh, respite in the courts, either with a peace order, um, some kind of an education. I know you, one of your colleagues, uh, Senator Hester, has talked about uh, wanting to expand the, the amount of education that's going on. Is that something you think is something that the General Assembly might take up? I think that's right. Um, ultimately, when uh, someone is the victim of bullying, um, they usually don't want monetary damages. They usually don't want a criminal prosecution of their tormentor. What they want is the social media posts to come down, the bullying to stop, and perhaps the bully to receive some type of counseling or education about why that behavior is so harmful. Um, like everything in life, you know, sometimes the courts can kind of reduce it to, uh, you know, to, to is it a crime or is it not a crime? Um, is it, should it be compensated or should it not be compensated? Of course, in real life, and the problem solving courts know this, real life is much more complicated. And oftentimes victims just want their, the perpetrators to acknowledge that what they did was wrong and to seek help so that it doesn't happen again. And just for those who are, who are listening, Grace is a young, like the, the severity and the importance of what Jeff was involved in, just to make an editorial comment, was a young girl from Howard County who ended up taking her own life, uh, committing suicide based on the se severe abuse that she was taking online. This is not just uh, schoolyard type name calling uh, that Jeff is, uh, that Senator Walschweiker is referring to. So we're looking forward to seeing what you come up with on um, to move forward on this. Let's uh, move forward on another controversial issue, one that has never uh, made its way through, though there's always conversation every year about this, and that's the issue of the election of judges. In Maryland, as you know, uh, for those who are listening, district court judges are not elected. Circuit court judges are elected. We're one of the states that does that. Jeff, what, do you, what are your thoughts about that, and where do you think Maryland uh, will be heading on that issue? So this has been a controversy that has kind of roiled the Judicial Proceedings Committee and the legislature as a whole for a while, and of course, um, even though those judges um, that have to come before the electorate have these kind of quasi-retention elections, um, it's a very strange system. 
even though many of us who are on this call have been used to it for years and it, it becomes our, our normal. And so we don't realize as we look around the country um, how odd it can be. Um, in my mind, the election of judges is, is not a great idea. And uh, I'm for abolishing the election of judges and going to an appointment and confirmation model, not dissimilar from the federal model. Obviously the federal model is not perfect um, as we've seen in recent years. Um, but nonetheless, I, I do think that um, many of our friends and neighbors who are not attorneys, um, they, the process is just confusing. The ability to get information about judges who are on the ballot is tremendously difficult. Um, and things like ballot order or gender take a lot of precedence when people have low information about the people that they are, are electing. And so I have supported and continue to support uh, the pure bill the Barbera bill that abolishes judicial elections in Maryland. Um, but an interesting nuance to this is um, there are a bunch of members, many of whom you know, I love, respect, and are friends with, who support kind of what I consider to be a little bit of a Rube Goldberg machine, a kind of compromise to, to judicial elections. A way, you know, it, basically what these compromise ideas do is if you get a certain number of votes for confirmation in the Senate, then you don't go before the electorate. But if you're confirmed by a majority, but not a super majority, then you do go before the electorate. And so folks have been um, trying to kind of float these compromise ideas. And I appreciate the intention, people just trying to kind of thread the needle to get something passed. But I have voted against those compromises because I think we already have a complicated system and complicating it further just to pass a bill I think in, in my mind has not been a good idea. So I have voted against those compromise bills and continue to hold out for the pure bill that gets rid of judicial elections in Maryland. And where do you think this is heading? This is a bill that has uh, been around for as long as at least I was around uh, starting in 1998. So the question is, is, will there be movement on this or is this kind of the, the, uh, the yearly debate that, that doesn't seem to go anywhere? Yeah, well, a couple of things. So next year is the final year of this term. Then we have a, an election. We'll have a new governor because Governor Hogan is termed out um, and some new members in the Senate and in, in the House. So I don't think this is kind of a debate that will continue on forever in perpetuity where it just becomes rote and we talk about it every year and don't do anything. Um, but I don't think next year is the year. So I think after you see the, the turnover after 2022, then this discussion will come back in force, um, we'll have a new chief judge who may be looking to, um, to, to talk about this issue again. And so um, I think eventually this will pass. Uh, let me just make a quick other point. Um, even though I believe strongly that judicial elections are a bad idea, I am fully respectful of folks on the other side. A lot of people believe that judicial elections provide increased diversity and particularly racial diversity on our bench and even though that is sometimes true and sometimes hasn't been true, I do respect that position. And, and people on the other side are well-meaning, well-intentioned, and very thoughtful in how they present um, at these debates. All right. Um, we are starting to get some questions. Uh, there's a question just to follow up on the uh, judicial elections. One of the areas that uh, I thought was, was interesting and interesting on multiple levels is the idea of independent voters, which is the fastest growing group in the state of Maryland and actually nationally um, participating in these judicial elections. As, as everyone knows, the, these are kind of quasi partisan elections, even though they're not supposed to be where, where you could have situations where if the primary goes a certain way, independent voters are not permitted to participate in the, so if it finishes in the primary there is no general election and so all the independent voters are essentially barred from participating in that election should these things be nonpartisan is there a mechanism short of doing away with the elections that you would support to allow independents to participate either in these judicial elections or in elections as a whole it's kind of a open ended question there yeah I mean, that could be a half step, right? So right now, it's a, it, this complicated process that we have that essentially excludes independent voters. The judges have to appear on the primary ballots of both parties, Democratic and Republican. And then you can get these strange situations where uh, one group of judges wins one primary and another 
um, wins another primary or, or, or not just judges, but candidates. And then they come together on the general election ballot and it's even more confusing. And so, um, so I'd like to scrap the whole thing obviously, but as a half step allowing independents to vote in the judicial primary can be helpful. And that's not foreign, right? So in my county, Montgomery County, um, we don't have partisan board of education elections. And so board of education candidates appear on the democratic ballot and the Republican ballot. But if you're an independent, they will appear on your ballot as well. And so essentially mimicking that model for judges could be a good idea until we find the votes to abolish it. Interesting and a good question. Um, so let me turn first. I actually, before we, I, I do want to talk about your role as a lawyer, as the chairman, as the uh, vice chair of Judicial Proceedings Committee, the new Senate leadership, a lot of things to, to unpack there. But we've, before we do, you had touched on police reform and just if you could just touch a little bit, you know, obviously we, we had a whole session where uh, Chairman Smith uh, came on and spoke in great detail and uh, Senator Carter as well about police reform and the issues uh, with that. But your thoughts on that and are there next steps? Kind of where are we in terms in terms of the law, in terms of what we did and where we may be heading, if, if anywhere else? Yeah, so we took dramatic steps to restore trust and accountability in our police and passed a series of bills to do that. Um, now, the, the job is not done. Um, we have to make sure that, that what we passed is workable. And there are certain aspects of the bill that advocates wanted um, that we weren't able to integrate this time. But because we delayed the effective date, we may be able to come back next legislative session to, to do much more when it comes to police reform and most importantly, increasing transparency and accountability in, in that process. Um, but you know, a legislature is not just a body, it's a group of individual people. And you and I have served with a number of incredible folks um, and very few um, are as incredible as, as Chairman Will Smith, who's the chair of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. It, it's my honor to serve as his vice chair. And um, you know, this is a man who, who served his country in wartime. I know as we come off of Memorial Day weekend, it's important to recognize that. Um, and is just a consummate statesman and legislator. And he shepherded this police reform package with poise and leadership, always allowing listening to come first. And so it was just a pleasure to watch him up close, do this work and make sure this, got, this package um, got from the beginning to the end over that three month period. Um, and none of that would have been possible, but for the leadership of Bill Ferguson, our new Senate president. Um, and Bill was committed to transparency and accountability in the bill. But more importantly, you, 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 know, he, you start to see this generational change within the chamber. And it's very exciting to watch. Um, and I'm honored to kind of have, have a close up seat on this because Bill um, is a policy guy at heart and um, politics are an important part of everything we do. Um, but ultimately, the politics comes from making good policy. And Bill was committed to a good work product, not only on police reform, but also the other things we've talked about here, especially COVID relief and education reform. And, and so it's just a pleasure to watch them both up close. Between Bill Ferguson and Will Smith, we're really in good hands when it comes to Senate leadership on a lot of these issues. I'm, I'm not going to take offense that you called it a generational shift since it was no, no, no. Will Smith. I feel like that's you calling me old, but we're not going to we're not going to go there. <laughs> The, uh, was there anything, let me, let me just ask you an open-ended question because I do yeah. want to talk, obviously this is the Bar Association, we're going to talk about you because you are one of just a small handful of attorneys uh, that, that's still down in Annapolis and I want to talk to you about that and also about how the Bar can be, much, it can be more involved and be helpful uh, to legislate. Before we get there though, I, I do want to ask you, were there other issues that are, that are, you know, kind of that we haven't talked about that are that came about this legislative session, things that maybe didn't get the publicity that some you know police reform or mountain controversy or cannabis got, but things that are none, nonetheless that are important that that people should know about. Well, I've been surprised that there hasn't been much press or attention on the fact that we passed a right to counsel for eviction cases in Maryland. Maryland is the first state in the entire union to pass a right to counsel in eviction cases. We've seen local jurisdictions do it, 
Baltimore City did it before we did at the state. And of course, other jurisdictions, I believe New York City is now doing that across this country have provided that. But no state has provided a right to counsel in eviction cases statewide. Now, um, part of the reason perhaps it didn't get as much attention is the bill that would fund the right to counsel failed. And so we're gonna look for alternative funding sources to make sure people facing evictions in our courts um, have counsel and that counsel is funded. But nonetheless, the right is now enshrined. Um, we actually called it access to counsel instead of right to counsel, mostly a semantic thing um, more than anything else. And so this is, this is really big, right? We know in the criminal realm that um, the law only works when people understand it. That's the basis of the Miranda decision. It, the, the law is only important in as much as people understand what the law is. And for people facing eviction, a lot of times they don't understand their rights. They don't understand the law. They don't understand um, the, the defenses that are available to them in the district court. And so passing this access to counsel in eviction cases for tenants is really a revolutionary idea, a small step towards civil Gideon um, that I think many of us on this call support. So thank you for asking about that. It's a, it's a big deal. And uh, for those on the call who, who practice in this area of law and, and you know, issues of property law and landlord tenant law, um, you know, let the word out. Because even landlords, I think, think this is a good idea because it makes sure that um, everyone gets the compensation that they uh, deserve and that everyone is represented through the process. All right, any other issues before we turn? I, I, I think that's the big one on my mind, but can I, can I go back to what you were asking about kind of lawyers in the General Assembly? Absolutely, yeah, that's an incredibly important issue, right? When I first got started, I mean, I, I like to tell people my seatmate on the House Judiciary was Joe Getty, who is now a member of the Court of Appeals. And um, you looked around the room and there were lawyers everywhere. And it seems like the number of lawyers, uh, practicing attorneys has dwindled. I know you are one uh, of, a, of just a handful in the Senate of, of, of attorneys. And, you know, I, I guess, could you speak to that experience and, and, you know, what it's like to be there as one of the practicing attorneys uh, left in the General Assembly? Yeah, well, let's start with the why, because I think that's important and not a discussion that is had often. So, you know, the number of attorneys has unquestionably dwindled. Um, it started before I got there, but has accelerated in the 15 years I've been in the assembly. And it, it's really to the detriment of the people of Maryland. But I think what is happening is, and you saw over your term uh, in the assembly, that it went from what was designed to be a part-time job into much more of a full-time position and the ability to manage a private legal practice on top of you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week of legislative work, even when you're not in session, is challenging. And even more so for, um, for people with young kids, men or women. And so, so you've had this kind of drain, this drain of attorneys from the assembly. And you have more people who are able to balance their lives like real estate agents, insurance agents, people who work, um, you know, can work odd hours um, are now more overrepresented in the assembly. That's not a bad thing. But what lawyers bring, and, and you saw this um, closely, is lawyers bring an innate sense of justice, um, an innate sense of fairness, uh, and a fluency with language that is really valuable in the assembly. And so we miss having um, attorneys practicing and in the assembly because we miss that kind of innate sense of, of justice and fluency and nuance, right? Um, lawyers, I think, are attuned to nuance in a way that um, people who come from the advocacy world may be less attuned to. And so we, I don't know if we can solve it, but what I can say is for members of the Bar Association, your voice is needed more than ever, um, is more valuable than ever. So if you care about issues, um, or just want to kind of legislate in the area that you practice in, please you know, come speak to me, um, speak to the Bar Association leadership, and we can get you plugged in because having lawyers involved is really a critical aspect of what we do every day in the assembly. Do you have any thoughts about specific ways? Uh, I know it's really important and it's a, it's a big focus of the state bar is to now have attorneys more, intera you know, more interactive with legislators back and forth? Are there specific, but 
you know, every, everybody has busy practices and they have lives. And so are there some specific ways that uh, you think the bar can be helpful to you, to members of the General Assembly um, in kind of participating and doing it in a productive way? Yeah. So I'd say there are three ways. Um, first is um, develop a relationship with your own individual legislators. And so call your delegates, call your senator, um, set up an appointment. All of us are, are very accessible. And now with, with COVID passing a little bit and the ability to meet, especially outside, um, I think you know just connecting with your own individual legislators is an important way to get involved and talk about what you're passionate about. Um, the second thing is get involved with bar association leadership, legislative leadership. So Bobby, you know, I know a number of attorneys on this call know you personally, they should give you a call. Uh, Richard Montgomery, Shally, you know, call the folks who are interacting with the legislators on a daily basis um, and get connected in that way. And then lastly is section council. So um, if you're not involved in section council, uh, get involved in section council. If you're involved in section council, but your section council is not particularly uh, well connected when it comes to legislative leadership, then encourage your section council to get more involved in the bills that come in front of us and the relationships that kind of make those, those things work. So those are the three ideas that come to my mind immediately. All right. Let me, I, I do have another question before, I know we're, we're, we're starting to run short of time and, and wrapping up, but one of the things that, I, that, that everyone says about Senator Jeff Waldstriker, and I, I, I do want you to speak to this issue, um, which is, is that you are one of these individuals who, unlike what we see in Washington, D.C., you, know, you listen to all sides of issues and work in an incredibly bipartisan fashion to try to fashion the best public policy. And it's, it's been a, a hallmark of the Senate and the, and the House for many years, this bipartisanship, which I think is unfortunately, you, know, you, you see none of it in Washington, DC. Can you speak to that issue, particularly uh, in wake of the news that several members of JPR will be leaving at the end of the se uh, session to go run for other offices? How has that affected your time in the General Assembly and you know, kind of what are your thoughts on that issue? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, let me start just by saying the obvious. I don't believe in compromise for the sake of compromise. Ultimately, it's the values and principles that I bring to the legislature that are most important. And so bipartisanship just as a sheen is not something that interests me. Um, but I do think we work better as a body when everyone's ideas are at the table. Um, and that means um, people from all sides, including you know, the, the progressives on my side um, and conservatives on the Republican side and everyone at the table exchanging ideas. And, um, and so we are losing for some members from our committee on the other side of the aisle. I'm sure they'll, they'll obviously be replaced by other members from that side of the aisle. Um, but it's important that we work together um, to see if we can find solutions. Now, sometimes that's not possible. I mean, we have to be open and honest about that. Sometimes um, you just have to, to move forward. But the benefit of working with the other side is even if you can't move forward on a consensus basis, um, and I, I don't mean this in a cynical way, um, engaging with the other side provides you with an early warning system for, for problems that you might see on the floor of the chamber or in the implementation of the bill. So there'll be oftentimes where I go to the Republicans and say, here's my idea. And, and they, don't want, they don't want to vote for the bill. They're not supportive of the bill. We can't reach consensus. But those conversations allow me to understand the debate on the floor of the Senate. And it, as you know, Bobby, one of the things that distinguishes the floor of the Senate compared to the floor of the House of, of Delegates is this kind of freewheeling open debate. And so having those conversations early, while important in their own right to see if we can reach some kind of bipartisan consensus, if we can't, and I just kind of have to move something forward or, or leadership has to move something forward, then we know what arguments are gonna be made on the floor. And as an attorney, as someone who is used to preparing for court, knowing those arguments of the other side ahead of time is an important way for me to pre prepare for the argument on the Senate floor. So it's it's beneficial in all those ways. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, for those who don't know Senator Waldstriker, I mean, deeply involved in things like criminal justice reform, which, which all, you know, unlike what you see in DC and actually sometimes in the house was really moved forward in, in together with everybody working together and getting a little bit 
And Jeff is a master of that. And I, th I think you need to be commended for, you know, not only writing everything on your little whiteboards, but also uh, making sure that everybody ha has, uh, you know, their say in terms of these issues. So we are coming to the end here. I think a lot of good, a lot of good issues, a lot of good important things. Is there anything that I missed that uh, in terms of the big ticket issues of this session or actually what is coming next session? What, what, what is uh, the 2022 session look like for Jeff Waldstriker before we end the session? Yeah, uh, well, again, thank you for, for having me. 2022 is an election year session. And so it's hard to predict because um, as many of folks on the call know, sometimes we get a little less done than perhaps I would like as a policymaker in an election year legislative session. Um, but nonetheless, um, coming back and filling any gaps in our police reform legislation will be important. And as I mentioned earlier, we had some really um, bleeding edge environmental legislation that just didn't make it past the post. I think we're going to come back and, and do a lot of that work. Um, of course, part of what we do is put out fires, right? Sometimes the Court of Appeal come down with a decision um, that the legislature doesn't agree with and we'll come back and overturn it. From time to time, and we've seen this too, the Court of Appeals will say, hey, legislature, we're not sure what to do here. <laughs> we need your input. Um, and then they basically ask us to act. And so some of what we do is reactive to what the court is doing um, and putting out those fires from time to time. So, so that's how I see the 2022 legislative session uh, shaping up. Of course, um, we'll be in person um, hopefully safe and sound and interacting with each other as normal. So um, I am excited just about that sense of normalcy with my colleagues. I think it'll work to the benefit of the people of Maryland. All right. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shally. But before I do, I just want to say uh, to Senator Waldstriker, thank you so much for talking about a lot of really interesting issues from Grace's Law, mountain controversy, cannabis legislation, election of judges, um, police reform, we didn't even touch on your involvement in your in the fracking ban. Maryland, uh, Maryland, still leading the way on that issue. Just a lot of really important issues that uh, Senator, you are involved in. A rising star in the Maryland General Assembly, and uh, it's just an honor to be here with you. So uh, thanks for thanks for joining us for an hour this morning, Jeff and uh, Shally. Back to you. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you so much, Senator. Um, we've had a a great crowd here, and really nice engagement, lots of questions. So we would welcome you back anytime, um, as you. I'm sure there'll be a lot more to talk about as we get ready for 2022. So thanks all for joining. Have a great morning.